Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Edge 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everybody. This is theCUBE, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. Check out ibmgo.com, you'll see all the main tent general sessions and keynotes. Obviously, you'll see the CUBE interviews there as well, and a bunch of content that's rolling in from social data. Matt Cadieu is here, CUBE alum, CIO of Red Bull Racing. Matt, good to see you again. Yeah, nice seeing you. Fresh off the keynote, uh, yeah. great job this morning. Really, uh, always a pleasure. You know, we were talking, it's been two years since we last had you on the CUBE. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so give us the update. What's been going on in the last couple of years? Uh, we've been busy. Um, so we just keep improving our capabilities. We, we rely very heavily on simulations, on analytics, and we keep improving our tools to get better understanding of our car and our tactics. But the, the, some of the new technology that's come on, you know, we've, we're early adopters, we take risks, and um, so our capabilities have grown a lot, and our infrastructure has also grown a lot. So without giving away any secrets, what are some of those new tech technologies that have sort of changed things? I mean, when we, First met, you know, everybody was talking Hadoop, and you know yeah. that was sort of, it was batch, and yeah. you now everything's real time. But what are some of the techs that have come in the last half a decade that have been interesting to you that you've been able to apply? So things that um, I need to be careful here <laughs> with, yeah. with some of the um, some Please of the things that are <laughs> uh, we're <alive>. secretive. Yes. <laughs> um, so we um, so the scale of the amount of data that we collect and the capability of processing it. And, and, um, and combining sources from multiple sources to do very sophisticated analysis. So the amount of data that we're processing is exponentially greater than what it was several years ago. And having the infrastructure that has the capacity, the performance, um, and security to manage that sheer amount of data, there's been a huge amount of effort to, to develop those systems. And um, the, the amount of data is a proprietary secret, you guys don't yeah. share that uh, for competitive reasons, but can you share this? You know you know Moore's law, right? You know the linear curve. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing your curve is non-linear. Is yeah, that a fair statement? It's exponential. So it's bending, and, and, and yeah. the, so the shape of the curve is bending even more exponentially than, yeah, than it used right. to. Yeah, that's right. And and things, um, so video processing, sound processing, telemetry, other sources um, that I, I can't talk about, but just the amount of input and the richness of that data and the amount of computational power needed to, to process it all and the amount of storage needed to, to house it all is, is huge. And cloud, well, a couple of years ago cloud was, you know, it was, it was there, maybe not as mature as it is yeah. now. Certainly IBM's cloud wasn't as mature as, as it is now and you're an yeah. IBM customer. But um, cloud is becoming an increasingly important part of what you're doing, right? Yeah, that's right. So we, we have a private cloud and uh, because of the size of some of our data sets um, and our need to get answers very quickly, we need infrastructure to be on premise. But then there's other things that don't have the same urgency. So what we're doing now is we're boosting or bursting out to public cloud and we're doing more and more of that. And, um, and we take it on a case by case basis and what's the problem we're trying to solve and then look at technically what's the sweet spot that will give us answers when we need them and financially what's the most cost effective way. Uh, so we will have a hybrid, we have a hybrid now. We will use, the trend is to use more public cloud, but we will always have on-premise uh, for some of the critical number crunching tasks. In your keynote, you talked about a spectrum of components in your stack, many yeah. of which involved an IBM Spectrum, spectrum brand. Right. But there were supercomputers in there, LSF, there was Power, Espera, which, was a, which is an acquisition that IBM just recently yeah, brought in, right. which I think is file related, uh, obviously cloud. What can you tell us about your, your stack? Yeah, so um, IBM Software Defined Infrastructure has a huge footprint in our estate. And so um, Spectrum LSF is what we use to schedule all of our supercomputers. And, um, and so all the heavyweight simulations and analysis tools, um, are, it's managed and controlled by Spectrum LSF. The hardware that it's managing comes from multiple vendors, some on-premise, some off-premise. So that, that's one key product. Um, managing all the data on site, everything doesn't need to be on expensive disk. And so we, we have eight petabytes of data in the company today and finding things that are aged and demoting it to tape or to cheap disk is something that we have to do just to afford, you know, afford our infrastructure. So we use Spectrum Protect to do that. 
Um, and then we also are using Symphony, um, Spectrum Symphony. So we do a lot of re real time analysis where we get telemetry and live feeds. And we have uh, dedicated clusters for that, and it's Symphony that's managing those that real time environment. So IBM software is really integral to um, our engineering infrastructure. Do you keep all your data? I mean, <laughs> um, we try to get rid of uh, <laughs> uh, low value things. So. We, things that can be derived, we get rid of, um, and our retention periods are usually three or four weeks. Sometimes you'll, um, you'll build on, on an analysis you've done, so you keep it around for a while if you're still iterating it, but then after a while you need to de demote it, and everything derived disappears, but how you set up the experiment we, t we tend to keep because we may need to dust it off in the future. But there again, you can demote it to more affordable, slower storage. So, um, so we use uh, per IBM Protect and rules in there to help uh, delete and demote that data. Yep. Matt, can you speak to kind of the speed of innovation and how do you make sure that your infrastructure can keep up? You know, we, we talk about the explosion of data, the explosive yeah. uh, of all of the centers that you have. You know, how do you know that what you buy today is going to be okay for what you need to do in a year or two from now? Yeah, so we, our company is a very technical company and engineering is very, very technology savvy. And, and so as they are trying to do more with simulations and analysis, um, we have a huge demand put on us to find the right solution. So how do we know that we're doing a good job? Um, that the guys, our, our customers internally tell us we're doing a good job or at least they don't complain. Um, how do we find the right solutions? We go out and we talk to the leaders in the marketplace, either leaders or, or new up and coming companies. And so we do proof of concepts, we do a lot of experiments, and when we make a procurement, we know that we're buying something that's fit for purpose. Let's talk about Formula One cars. So <laughs> <laughs> tell us more about Formula One cars. You know, give us the stats, like the horsepower, the speed, how fast they go. Okay, yeah. Give us some fun, fun facts. Yeah, so F1 cars, it's the top of the food chain. They're the most sophisticated racing cars. Um, the cars are lightweight, they weigh just over 700 kilograms. Um, they have a power unit that has about 750 brake horsepower, um, and that's uh, provided by an internal combustion engine and also hybrid technology. Um, so with, they're also instrumented with a lot of electronics, so onboard computers, control systems. Um, and then the shape of the car is designed aerodynamically, and the car generates downforce that exceeds the weight of the car by about three times, so it's an upside down wing. And, and that's what allows the car to go around corners very quickly, um, is the downforce generated. So the cars are engineering, um, uh, um, engineering extreme machines, and a huge amount of engineering effort goes into designing them. Right, so Matt, one of the things we look at kind of automotive in general is the, you know, blurring the lines between kind of the person and the machines. Yeah. You know, how do, how do you look at that on the racing side? Yeah, so, so the driver um, in the sport, the driver needs to be in control of the car. And ultimately, um, you can give a, a bad driver a great car and he won't win, or you can give a great driver a lousy car and he won't win. So both the technology in the car and the driver, both parts need to be strong. And in the sport, um, we, we're not allowed by regulation to autonomously change settings on the car. The driver needs to be in control. But if you look at the steering wheel and the number of uh, dials and buttons on there, there are a lot of modes that the driver can put the car into. So we provide decision support to a driver that's data-driven with analysis and simulation. But the driver, ultimately, you're asking him to push the car as, to the outer, outer limit. And, and he needs to be comfortable in what he's doing. Right. So it's a combination of driver and analytics and giving good advice to the driver. All right, so Watson can't be behind the wheel yet. No, <laughs> no, and, uh, and never will be. Hopefully I ever. Think. But how is that adjudicated? I mean, is there some kind of you know, Big Brother watching? Yes, or? there is. Yeah, um, okay. good. So we, um, so we have a digital radio and intercom system, and the race authorities can hear everything we're saying. Um, and then also, when the car pulls into the garage, everything that's logged in the car, um, the authorities plug in, and they'll know exactly what we were doing technically. And um, so, in, in the sport, you push the boundaries to, you know, to the extent that you can, but we also need to be careful that we're compliant because we can be disqualified or fined if, um, if we're not. It, is there gray area where... Yeah, always. Right. Always. And, and so you, you, I, I presume you're pushing the envelope. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I think if you're, if you're wimpy and you're too conservative, you won't win races. 
Um, but then also you, you do need um, a basis to say you know, what we're doing is legal and um, and yeah, and of course we push um, as hard as we can. If it's not been tested in the in the racing compliance, you know, court, then you yeah you get a ruling. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but yeah, the, the the driver is really really critical because you're asking him to absolutely push to the limit. And if he doesn't actually trust the car, and when he you know turns the wheel, if if it actually if he doesn't believe the car will be in control, then he won't push as hard. So it's really important that. Um, that the, he's comfortable with the car. And, and then also we show the driver a lot of the analysis and we explain what's happening under the covers. So that the, the more he understands the car, the harder he will also push it. And then his feedback also gets fed back to engineering and it helps us to improve the car uh, for future races. And, and we're talking top speeds of 200? Yeah, that's uh, right. Miles per hour, that's right. And, yeah. and, and zero to, I guess yeah. zero to 60 is irrelevant, but. Zero, zero, yeah, to, zero 100. to 100 and back to zero is about 4.8 seconds. Zero to 100, back to zero. Back to zero. In yes. 4.8 seconds. That's right. That's a lot of Gs. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and then G forces can exceed also six Gs. So high speed corner with braking, uh, the car and the, and the driver can um, you know, have to withstand a lot of G forces. So what do you make, I mean, as an observer, I mean, you, you, you can't use a, a autonomous you know, technology in your sport, but you guys are in the vehicle business. What do you make of what's happening you know, with this whole autonomous vehicle? Just this personal opinion. Um, I like driving personally <laughs> and, um, and really don't want to be driven, but I think um, you, you know, there's a lot of people that commute and it's wasted time and I can see you know, autonomous cars for many people being something that helps them and gives them more time. My personal opinion is though, um, I, I grew up in Detroit and uh, you know, I like driving then and still like driving. Such an interesting topic though, because m many of us learn how to drive in a stick shift, yeah. which is more fun. Yeah. Uh, you, when you turn 16 in the United States, it's part of your rite of passage. One of the first things you yeah, do is go right. get your license. That's right. And you, one wonders socially, what the implications of autonomous vehicles are. Yes, I, there's all these great things, you yeah. know, potentially, anyway. But in terms of the, the social implication to a, to a teenager, yeah. you know, and an yeah. individual who yeah. loves to drive, yeah. you know, what do you think's going to happen there? I mean, maybe it's a, yeah. maybe it's a hybrid world. You know, I right? think that the transition is, will be challenging when you have people driving, making human error, and you have machines talking to one another, but when they both have to coexist, <laughs> Um, that will be adventurous. <laughs> and, uh, Drive, driving's fun, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh. but it will happen with um, with all the automakers investing huge money and with technology advancing, it, it will happen. So you called your um, your your vehicle an evolving prototype. What does yeah. that mean? Yeah, so it changes every race. And um, so we, we don't just design one car at the start of the season and then just race it continuously. We actually tear the car apart and we rebuild it to a new specification that's targeted for the racetrack that we're going to. So every racetrack has a different shape, different surface, different weather conditions, and we micromanage the spec of the car to be optimized for that race. So we design new parts, new assemblies that are targeted for specific races. And um, so every race, hundreds, sometimes thousands of parts, new parts get put onto it. And last year we had more than 30,000 engineering changes throughout the course of the year. So it is really a prototype. We, we don't mass produce. We have two cars that, that compete in the race. We have a few spare chassis um, that we introduce in the middle of the year or if we have an accident. But, um, but yeah, we, with those cars, we tear them apart and modify them for absolutely every race. So is the strategy to be a decathlete or a specialist or, or, or both, if you know what I mean by that? You, like, is it horses for courses? You know, some horses do well on tight turns, others do well on wide sweeping turns. Yeah. Some do, cars must do well with like tire wear. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's all, it's, uh, it's all kinds of trade-offs. So what's Red and, Bull? Uh, what is your sort of sweet spot? What are you um, known for? So, so high speed, or tracks with a lot of corners, high speed or slow speed corners are a sweet spot. Um, we don't have the most powerful engine on the grid today, so tracks that are long straights are our worst tracks. Ones that have more curves are, are the sweet spot. 
And, um, and when we set up the car, we make a lot of engineering trade-offs, and there's a lot of actually hard, hard choices to be made. And this is also where we do a lot with simulations and a lot with the sensors on the car and comparing it to simulations. And on a Friday and Saturday, when we have practice sessions before a race, we're making data-driven decisions around what parts go on, what settings go onto the car in order to set it up so that it's set up to then perform well in the race on Sunday. So all of that is very, very IT intensive, generates a huge amount of data. And is, is that choice cultural? In other words, you know, like, I like skiing the bumps. You know, yeah. I don't like going the big wide sweeping turns. It's sort of, you know, the tight turns, is, is it because it's more fun and that's the culture of Red Bull? Or is it just no, sort of what the um, engineering is good at? Or? Ultimately, our goal is to win the race. No matter and, what. Um, <laughs> no matter, yeah. And um, yeah, within the rules to win the race. And so yeah, to, make the engineering, yeah. to make the engineering choices so that you have a car that will be optimized for the race. And, and part of it is factoring what do the drivers like, but then also it's understanding the track and the car. And when you have hundreds of choices around the setup of it, it's making the right ones. So it's very, very data driven. So how are you guys doing? Um, we're doing all right. Uh, we're in second place in the um, in the, t the league table today. Uh, Mercedes um, is the top team, and we're closing the gap to them. And we're above Ferrari. So, <laughs> that's pretty good. In between so, Mercedes and Ferrari, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're we're improving, and um, and we're in a strong position in second. Um, next year's interesting, where there's a major rule change. So right now we're also splitting engineering resources and putting a lot of effort into next year, which has some very, very big changes to the architecture of the car. And, and those rules, I mean, sure it's changed, slight, small rules every year, but you're talking yeah, about some big are, rule yeah, changes. Yeah, it's not evolution, this is more revolution. So it goes back to the big fat tires. Um, the aerodynamic limits and constraints are very, very different. Um, so next year's series will be very different than, than what it is this year. Um, and then Renault, our engine partner, also has a lot of improvements in the pipeline. And so with our chance to innovate on the chassis side next year, where we've always been strong, and with improvements on the engine side, we think next year is going to be the chance to really give Mercedes a run for the money. Fun, oh, that's got an engineering uh, playground. That's yeah, uh, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's non-stop <laughs> non yeah, engineering, design a faster car, both for this season and the upcoming season but the IT infrastructure and applications needed to support it. If we didn't have robust, highly capable solutions, we could not design a fast car. Well, Matt, congratulations on the success that you're having. Last thoughts on, on Edge, things you're, you're learning here or sharing and things that are exciting you? Yeah, I, it's a chance for me to learn and I get to meet other people um, and ask them how they're addressing challenges. And I also get to meet uh, IBM experts and, and some of their partners and ask about what's in the pipeline and, and other things that could potentially benefit us um, as we continue to improve. So it's, um, it's a chance to learn and uh, really enjoy the, uh, the session. Excellent, well great to see you again. All right, nice to see you. Revving our way through IBM Edge. Keep it right there everybody, Stu and I will be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from IBM Edge, right back.